So thank you all for joining me on this exciting Soccer Wednesday. And Vivian, thank you for the introduction and for inviting me to speak. Today I'm going to tell you a little bit about my research, which stands at the interface of microbes and humans. As many of you have heard from the popular news, science shows that are awesome like the cosmos, we are a combination of not only our own human cells, but tons and tons of bacterial, viral, and fungal particles that live within us and among us. And so the title of my talk today is Explorations of Human Disease, the Bacterial Frontier. So my story starts uh, long before I was born, um, actually hundreds of years before I was born, in 1677 with Anton van Leeuwenhoek. Anton van Leeuwenhoek was really the first person to master the use of the light microscope to discover new particles. And what you see over here is a lovely painting of him and his very first pictures of bacteria. So what he had done was use the light microscope, which was at that point an amazing advance in technology, to visualize tiny little living particles in fluids. Fast forward 200 years approximately, and we come to Louis Pasteur. So I think almost everybody in this audience at some point or another has learned about Louis Pasteur. And Louis Pasteur is famous for a bunch of different experiments that he did. But you may not know that what he cut his scientific teeth on was this problem. He worked in a tiny area in France that was well known for its wine industry. And the problem that was brought to his attention was that really fancy bottles of wine were turning into vinegar. Um, this is, of course, tragic beyond belief <laughs> and deserving of the attention of a very, very gifted scientist. And this is what he spent years working on. What he realized doing the following experiment was that bacteria from the environment were actually causing this problem. And so the clever experiment that he did is kind of pictorially laid out here. He took wine, put it in this special glass flask that has a curved neck, and he boiled the wine, just briefly, not enough to get rid of all the alcohol. When he kept the curved neck on the glass flask, which prevented stuff from the environment from entering the broth, or the wine in this case, the wine remained clear for months and months, if not years. If, however, he removed that curved neck and just broke it off, he found that very rapidly, microorganisms would grow within the broth. And this suggested that something from the environment was entering the broth and causing it to spoil. Um, in so doing, he was able to demonstrate that bacteria were really the source of the problem. Um, and he really pushed forward the idea of germ theory. So my introduction to germ theory came about 30-something years ago when my parents bought me this book. Um, so this is, I actually had my parents take a picture of the book at their house and send it to me. Um, and this is a book called The Value of Believing in Yourself. It is a value tale, and it is a story of Louis Pasteur. Now, my parents bought me this book not because they wanted me to believe in myself, um, but rather they wanted me to learn about germ theory. <laughs> And so I did. Um, and what I learned about was Louis Pasteur, who is pictured over here. Um, Louis Pasteur, along with Robert Koch, who went on to win the Nobel Prize, showed that many diseases are caused by the presence and action of pathogens, so viruses, bacteria, fungi, that live among us and can be harmful. So now I've kind of talked to you about the fact that there are microbes that can be both helpful and harmful within the human body. And we've learned a little bit about this idea that germs can make us sick, and, and we all know that. We now know that microbes are everywhere, and this is just a little pictorial demonstration of all of the different types of microbes that live throughout our gut. Typically, when we're in the clinic, so when I'm wearing my doctor hat instead of my science hat, if I suspect that there may be an infection in a patient, we do pretty similar things all the time, which is I think you have a strep throat, I swab your throat, we send it down to the micro lab, maybe they culture it on a Petri dish, Eventually, we take these cultured bacteria and we look at it under a microscope. And if we're able to see something under the microscope, then we can draw it, get a good sense of what it looks like, and then we match that picture to what's in essentially a book of usual suspects. So this is no different than like a mugshot book. We look for other bacteria that have caused problems before. And so what we're excellent at doing in the clinical realm is identifying bacteria and viruses that we know cause disease. 
which is fantastic, but it really does lead us into trouble sometimes when you don't have one of these usual suspects. And so the case I'm going to tell you about today is a real life case. This is a mystery that presented itself or presented herself to a local hospital in 2008. In 2008, a 30-year-old woman presented to the hospital with a white blood cell count of 37.5 thousand per microliter. This is a blood smear, which is when you take someone's blood, you put it out on a glass slide, and you look at it under the microscope. And in this picture, typically you'll see a lot of these red cells, which are red blood cells, and you see a couple of white blood cells, which in this picture are stained blue. What you can see here is she has many more than a couple of white blood cells in this high-powered field. And in fact, she has almost four times the normal amount. Based on this and the identification of a very typical translocation, she was diagnosed with a special type of leukemia known as chronic myelogenous leukemia. Until about 20 years ago, chronic myelogenous leukemia was an incredibly significant and severe disease that would rapidly lead to progression to acute leukemia and eventually death. But about 20 years ago, a major discovery was made, a precision medicine discovery, as it were, which was scientists identified a drug that could specifically target this translocation. That drug was called imatinib. Um, the trade name of that drug is Gleevec. And that drug actually works incredibly well at keeping CML at bay. Unfortunately, or fortunately, this is real life, and this 30-year-old woman had just gotten married. She really wanted to have a baby, and she bargained with her doctors and said, look, we know that imatinib is not tested in pregnancy, and so they really didn't want her to get pregnant while on the drug. She said, can I just have a child first, and then I promise I'll go on the drug. So this was the deal that was made. She gave birth to a beautiful baby, healthy baby, Unfortunately, shortly after giving birth, the number of white blood cells in each high-powered field tripled. So now she has mostly white blood cells, and she actually ended up with a white blood cell count of 135,000 per microliter. So over 10 times the normal amount. At this point, she no longer had chronic leukemia, but a much more aggressive acute leukemia. Her doctors decided to go ahead and put her on that miracle drug, imatinib, and luckily she actually responded quite nicely with a peripheral blood smear here that shows only a couple of white blood cells. Now this is fantastic, but the drug actually hasn't been approved for use in keeping acute leukemia under wraps. And so given her young age, the fact that she has this amazing healthy baby to live for, and the fact that we know that imatinib doesn't keep acute leukemia at bay, a plan was made to pursue another type of therapy called bone marrow transplant or stem cell transplant. And so in 2009, she pursued curative therapy with a double umbilical cord blood stem cell transplant. So what is a stem cell transplant? Uh, many of you have probably heard the term. I had heard the term when I started my internship at Brigham and Women's Hospital in 2007. Um, and to be entirely honest, I wasn't exactly sure what it was. Um, but I've had a lot of training since that point, and this is basically what a bone marrow transplant is. It's when you take a patient who has usually an acute leukemia, sometimes lymphoma, that you cannot cure with regular treatment alone. What you do is give them a bunch of anti-cancer drugs or chemotherapies at a really high dose, as well as radiation to try to kill off any leukemic cells that are present. You then take bone marrow, which is where the bone marrow stem cells are, from a healthy donor, and you inject that bone marrow into the patient or the recipient. Now this process is a cornerstone of treatment of leukemias or lymphomas that cannot be cured with regular chemotherapy alone. And so it offers a chance of cure. It's actually a phenomenal treatment. Unfortunately, the mortality and the morbidity are very high, with up to 30% of patients dying in the first year after transplantation due to complications of the procedure. Stem cells can be obtained from multiple sources. We originally called this bone marrow transplantation because bone marrow was taken from the hip bone, as de demonstrated here. As you can imagine, for the healthy donor, having a really big needle stuck into your hip bone over and over is pretty unpleasant. And so technologies have advanced, and now we can collect stem cells from the peripheral blood, from an IV, 
or even from umbilical cord blood sources, which is when babies are born. There are a bunch of stem cells in that umbilical cord. The patient did actually fairly well after her transplantation until day 158, which is 158 days after her stem cells were administered, when she developed watery diarrhea with mucus. Now this wasn't any garden variety diarrhea. This was so bad that she was incredibly dehydrated and landed in the hospital several times. So at this point, we've got a problem. Microscopic evidence of a potential infection was found when they took biopsies from her colon and looked at it under a microscope. And she was surprisingly actually found to respond to antibiotics, which really made this look and smell like an infection. Despite this, all of the standard infectious studies that were performed by the microbiology lab were negative. She had no evidence of graft versus host disease, which is when immune cells from the graft end up attacking the host tissue. And she had no evidence of relapse, which was fantastic. So this put her disease in a really big category that we doctors call idiopathic. Um, idiopathic is a great word. It's got a lot of syllables, and it feels very reassuring. <laughs> Unfortunately, when you look it up in the dictionary, idiopathic means relating to or denoting any disease or condition that arises spontaneously or for which a cause is unknown. And so despite its reassuring length, it really just means we don't know what's going on, um, which is unsatisfying and unsettling if you're a doctor, and even more unsettling and unsatisfying if you're a patient. Throughout the course of stem cell transplantation, there are lots of complications. I described to you earlier that it can offer a chance of cure, but it is a very dangerous therapy. Over here, I've kind of drawn the timeline of a typical stem cell transplant on the x-axis. This line over here is where we initiate the stem cell transplantation process. We give people tons of chemotherapy, radiation, as I described, some antibiotics to clear out their gut of potentially dangerous bacteria. And throughout that time period, patients can have organ toxicity from these drugs. At this dotted line is when stem cells are administered. And after that point, because their immune system has essentially been obliterated by the chemotherapy and radiation, and their stem cells haven't quite formed a whole new immune system, patients have infections. They can have relapse of their leukemia or lymphoma, which unfortunately is all too common. They can have graft versus host disease or that immunologic complication that I described. If patients are lucky enough to make it out to this very late time point, they can suffer from secondary malignancies due to the DNA damage that occurs with treatment in the upfront setting. And throughout this process, idiopathic complications abound. So my hypothesis was that a subset of mystery syndromes in this post-transplantation setting are triggered by microbial pathogens. This didn't seem so crazy to think that patients who don't have a competent immune system might get strange infections. Furthermore, I thought maybe we can use sequencing-based approaches where we sequence the DNA to discover these pathogens. If we take these sequences and then analyze them using computer-based programs that assign a taxonomy. And a taxonomy is basically a designation of what type of bacteria, virus, fungus, or other organism this sequence might belong to. So in order to tell you more about my story, I should probably step back and tell you a little bit about next generation sequencing. Um, next generation sequencing is in one shape or form what almost everybody in this building does, at least part of their time. And what next generation sequencing is, is a process whereby we can start with a cell. You can take the DNA from nucleus of cells, if cells do have nuclei. And then when you unravel these chromosomes, you have a whole bunch of DNA, or the genetic code of these cells. You can then cut these pieces of DNA into tinier pieces, and then sequence. And you can sequence each and every one of these pieces individually. In the rest of my talk, I'll represent these reads as these short bars. And so the idea is you can start with almost 3 billion base pairs over here and end up with about 101 base pairs over here in little tiny pieces of the total DNA puzzle. So here we have to take a little bit of a break. 
And I have to ask you the following question. If you were to go over, you know, across the street to this local seafood restaurant, and you got a mixed seafood platter, how would you tell what different types of seafood were in the platter? Anyone? You could taste it. You could look at it. You could read the menu. Um, and then you figure out, oh, there's like fish, and there's lobster, there are crabs, and octopus in this mixed seafood platter. But I like to think to myself, <laughs> you know, what would Eric Lander do? Um, for those of you who don't know Eric Lander, Eric Lander is uh, our big boss, um, and this is his institute. Um, Eric is famous for having put together the first draft human genome. And if Eric was faced with this problem, I don't think he would taste or look or read the menu. No, no. He would sequence it. <laughs> he would take a little bit of it across the street, extract some DNA, and get it sequenced. And in so doing, he could then use those different 101 base pair sequences that come out of the mixed seafood platter and find sequences that are assigned to fish and lobster and crabs and octopi. And so that's really no different than what we can do in humans. If humans are a mixture of human cells and microbes, as I previously described, well, then I could probably take a little piece of this gut, sequence it, and then assign it to different organisms based on sequence homology and identify different types of bacteria, viruses, and of course, human sequences. And so that's the premise for the type of work that we decided to embark upon. And the disease that I decided to study was exactly that mystery case that I had described to you earlier. This disease ended up being called cord colitis syndrome. It was an idiopathic antibiotic responsive diarrheal syndrome and it affected only patients who had undergone umbilical cord blood stem cell transplants between 60 days and one year after transplantation. There were 11 confirmed cases over seven years at a single institution, suggesting that this wasn't just a big outbreak, you know, five cases that all happen after somebody goes to a wedding or a church barbecue. And all of the microbiology studies were negative. As I told you earlier, there were there was evidence of infection when you looked at these cross-sections of the colon under a microscope. And so this was really, for all intents and purposes, something that seemed like a mystery infection to me. So traditional pathogen discovery would suggest that I should start with the disease. I should take that colon tissue or maybe stool samples from those patients and culture it out in lots of different ways to try to isolate the potential pathogen. And then, eventually, that pathogen would make its way over to the Broad Institute, where we sequence everything that comes in the door, um, and we would sequence it. But we thought to ourselves, well, why can't we do what Eric Lander would do in this case with the mixed seafood platter? Why can't we start with the disease, just sequence the tissue, which is a mixture of human cells and microbes, identify a candidate pathogen, and then try to isolate the organism? thereby reversing the process of pathogen discovery. So pathogen discovery by next generation sequencing really follows that set of logic. This is a, an example of what type of data we get when we do next generation sequencing. Um, whereas I and some of the other people in the small group within our laboratory use sequencing for pathogen discovery, the vast majority of people use sequencing to identify alterations in the human genome generating these short nucleic acid reads, or these small fragments of DNA. When we generate these small fragments of DNA, we can line them up to homologous sequences or similar sequences in the human reference chromosomes. We can do that, and we can identify mutations and changes in the number of reads that you would expect to align. You can even identify translocations, for those of you who uh, may know a little bit about translocations, such as the BCR ABLE one I described earlier. And whereas most of those reads are what really interest the people in this building, for the small group of us who work in pathogen discovery, we're really interested in what's left over, which is what is the stuff that is not human? Because that non-human sequence may contain some candidate pathogens. 
So starting with that premise that infected tissues are a mixture of human cells, which are these pink blobs, and microbes, which are these smaller organisms, we figure that we can just extract DNA in bulk, because DNA is the genetic code of bacteria, of human cells, and of many viruses. If we extract the DNA in bulk, it should be roughly a mixture of microbial DNA and human DNA, and we can then start with this mixture of DNA. In this particular experiment, what I did was as follows. I told you there were 11 patients who were described to have this disease in a single cohort. I started with all 11 patients and figured out who had had colon biopsies before and after antibiotic therapy. That limited me to a total of n, pa uh, n equals five patients. When I obtained all of the gut biopsies from these patients and extracted DNA, in a subset of cases, I had enough DNA to pursue whole genome sequencing. In many other cases, I didn't have enough to do whole genome sequencing, and I reserved that set as a validation cohort to investigate later. So starting with that mixed population of microbial and human DNA, we took this through next generation sequencing, which led us to have a pile of mixed reads, millions of reads that came from humans, from microbes, et cetera. Our first step was to take all of these reads and align them to the human genome. Remember, these are human biopsies, so most of these reads are gonna come from humans, and we remove those and throw them away because I don't actually care about human sequences. All I care about is the stuff that's left over. If we then go to these non-human sequences, we can then iteratively take each and every one of these reads and align them to the reference database. So every time someone at the Broad Institute or another related institute sequences a new organism, they post the sequence of the new organism in a reference database. And so we can take each and every one of these reads and compare it to anything that's ever been sequenced before. Now I'll tell you at this point, what I really thought was going to happen here um, was inspired by my love of the veterinary literature. Um, so those of you in the audience who know me well know that I like to read a little bit of different scientific literature, and I'm fascinated by domesticated animals. The reason I'm fascinated by them is they've been bred for interesting characteristics like making more milk if they're dairy cattle, or you know, having cute puppy eyes if they're dogs. And because of this, they actually end up being a little bit immunologically abnormal, um, just like our stem cell transplantation patients, and they get weird infections. And so I had read about this terrible colitis that affects dairy cattle. It's called Yoni's disease. And this colitis looked, for all intents and purposes, just like the colitis that we had seen in our patients under a microscope. And that colitis is caused by a mycobacterium. Uh, mycobacteria are the genus that includes tuberculosis-causing organisms, but it also includes other organisms. So what I thought I was going to find was a bunch of reads that aligned to Mycobacterium paratuberculosis. Unfortunately, science is filled with disappointments, um, and this was my first one. I was just totally wrong. Um, like in a pile of 100 million reads, there were three reads that aligned poorly to a mycobacterium. And so my hypothesis was incorrect. What I was surprised to find was when I did this experiment, the majority of the reads actually didn't align to any organism at all. So the majority of the non-human reads were not mappable at all. These are the actual data from this experiment. So this is a busy slide with a lot of numbers, but I'll just walk you through it. I'll call your attention to the fact that each column represents a patient's biopsy. So this is patient five, this is patient 11. This is before antibiotics and after antibiotics. Once again, before antibiotics and after. And what you can tell here is that the vast majority of the reads are actually unmapped, at least the non-human reads, with more reads that are unmapped than mapping to even known bacteria. I knew this was weird because I had done a similar experiment sequencing gut biopsies from patients with another gut disease called Crohn's disease. And when I had done that experiment, I ended up with only about 20,000 unmapped reads for a similar sequencing depth coverage. So this led me to ask the question, well, why are there so many unmapped reads here? Could it be that there's just a classification error, meaning our computer program isn't working quite right? Or maybe 
because we rely on each and every one of these reads matching to something that is already sequenced, an organism that is already sequenced, and in the reference database, maybe there's just an organism or organisms in this sample that haven't yet been discovered and sequenced. So if that second hypothesis was true, how might we test it? Really, what we're asking ourselves is, how do you identify a new pathogen, something that is not a usual suspect, a perpetrator who is not in a mugshot book? Really, what we had were tiny little pieces of this DNA puzzle, little tiny fragments of DNA that we thought we might be able to piece together into the picture of the genome of a potentially novel organism. In order to do this experiment, we found ourselves consulting with folks in the microbial genomics group here. Um, so why microbial genomics? Well, you may know that microbial genomes, bacterial genomes, for example, are not as big as human genomes, which means that we can sequence a bacterium and put together the genome pretty quickly. The way we do that is we obtain isolated pure cultures of bacteria, extract the DNA, cut it up into pieces, sequence it all, and then we look for little tiny areas of overlap between these reads. When we find areas of overlap between the reads, we can then piece together the puzzle of the longer fragment of DNA going from a bunch of reads to a bunch of contigs or contiguous sequences. And so I thought maybe we could borrow some of these tools from the microbial genomics folks. Um, they've developed a bunch of interesting computer programs that rely on graph theory and mathematics to do exactly this. And we said, let's start with all of the non-human reads, just from patient 11. So everything I'm going to tell you from here on out for a period of time is going to be only about patient 11. Let's take those 4.6 million unmapped reads from patient 11, and let's apply one of these computational assembly algorithms. We had done similar experiments with the Crohn's disease samples that I had described earlier, those 20,000 unmapped reads. And when we did so, we could find overlapping segments long enough to generate contigs that were 1.4 KB long, so 1,400 base pairs long, which is pretty good coming from 101 base pair read to start with. The idea was if we could find these longer contigs, maybe we'd be able to at least identify a related organism based on comparing it to the reference database. So when we did this experiment, this is what we found. We found that we had 99 different contigs, and when you added up the sequence length of all of those 99 contigs, it was a stunning 7.6 million base pairs long. This blew my mind. Um, I can remember exactly where I was when I saw this, um, and I actually had to take a seat. Um, you know, there aren't many times as a scientist in your life that you get super lucky, um, and this was one of them. This was amazing. You know, I was looking for maybe like 1.5 KB or maybe like 3,000 base pairs if I was super lucky, um, but this was like hitting the jackpot. The longest contig was 335,000 base pairs, and the mean contig length was about 77,000 base pairs. But this still left me with a problem which was I had about 99 separate contigs. And the question was, well, do these 99 different contigs belong to all different organisms? Or do they belong to just one? And so it became a problem of taking these 99 contigs and trying to figure out how many bins they fit into and what those bins were. Just to give you a, a point of reference, a viral genome can be about 10,000 base pairs. A bacterial genome can be anywhere from 1 million base pairs to about 15 million base pairs. And so these 99 contigs really could have represented 99 different organisms or just one. So in order to answer this question, we thought we would invoke some thinking here. Um, so this is your turn to uh, test your skills. And I have a pop quiz for you, which is can you tell the difference between a mouse and a man? if all I gave you was a one million base pair sequence of DNA. So let's say I gave you this one million base pair sequence of DNA, gave you your laptop computer, locked you in a room, and didn't give you internet. 
Everybody was fine until I said you couldn't have internet. <laughs> um, how would you be able to tell, or what's one way you could tell the difference between a mouse sequence and a sequence from a human? It turns out that if you count the number of total G's and C's compared to A's and T's in the genome, mice and men have a very slightly different percentage of G's and C's. Mice have about 42% Gs and Cs, and humans have about 41%. So it's a very small difference, but you can figure if you have a million nucleotides to count, you could figure this out. And so using this type of logic and similar sorts of approaches, we decided to look at each and every one of those 99 contigs and characterize them based on characteristics such as percent GC content, which is arrayed on the x-axis, and another kind of evaluatory component, which is coverage. Coverage is a little bit more complicated, so I'll leave that aside for now. I'm happy to talk with folks afterwards about it. But the idea is that for a given organism, contigs that are fairly long should have a similar coverage and a similar percent GC content. And so on this graph, every contig is represented as a circle. The size of the circle corresponds to the size of the contig. So this biggest circle over here is that 335,000 base pair contig. What you can see is that the majority of these contigs actually have a similar percent GC content and a similar coverage. They are color coded based on the top blast hit, which means what is the genus of the organism to which this contig is most similar. And you can tell that most of these are red, which means that most of these sequences are most similar to a single genus, which is Brady rhizobium. Brady rhizobium is a bacterial genus. What you can see is there are some very small contigs that are significant outliers, and we actually went through them one by one, but I'll take you through this one in particular. This is a contig that had both a lower percent GC content and a lower coverage. As you can tell by the circle's small size, it was a very short contig. And when we compared that to what was in the reference database, it actually ended up being very closely related to a SEN virus. Um, and so a SEN virus seemed like it was pretty different from Brady rhizobia, which are bacteria. And so we concluded that this contig likely doesn't belong to the same bucket as the rest of these contigs. And it likely is in its own small bucket of being a new virus. So when we went through these contigs one by one, that SEN virus contig was actually the only one that we ended up omitting thinking that it belonged in a separate bucket, which meant that 98 of these 99 contigs were felt to belong to the genome of a single organism. So what have I told you? Um, for those of you who have been checking on the World Cup scores, I'll just bring you up to speed. <laughs> I started with this amazing case of diarrhea. And this amazing case of diarrhea got better with antibiotics and looked and smelled like an infection. And yes, I know that sounds funny. Um, we sequenced colon biopsies from these patients, did next generation sequencing, got tons of reads, looked at all of the non-human reads, and ended up with a bunch of unmappable reads. We thought maybe there is the genome of a new organism in these reads, and we looked for areas of overlap and used a computational assembly algorithm to generate a bunch of these contigs or long sequences. And based on analyzing those contigs, we decided all but one of those contigs likely corresponded to the draft genome of a new bacterium. So now we have this new bacteria, but typically what people do is they like take a bacteria and they look at it under a microscope, and they stain it, and then they write a paper that says, you know, I looked at it under the microscope, it is rod-shaped, I stained it with this, it turned purple. Um, but you can't do any of that when you actually don't have the organism. And so to classify, instead of taking those sorts of approaches, I decided to try to classify it based on its sequence alone. And we used a tool called Philoflan, which has been developed by Curtis Huttenhauer, who is a member of the Broad community as well, and a brilliant computational biologist, to figure out where in the family tree of bacteria this organism belonged. And what you'll see is that the cord colitis syndrome organism ended up right here, um, closely related to Brady rhizobium japonicum. 
I'll just point out one feature, which is this line that connects the common ancestor of B. japonicum and the cord colitis syndrome organism together is very long, which suggests that there's been a lot of evolution between the common ancestor and this organism. Based on its location in the phylogenetic tree, it seemed like it was most closely related to other Brady rhizobia, which meant that this was in the genus Brady rhizobium. And because we found it in the gut, and I got to name it, and I'm not creative, I named it Brady rhizobium enterica, because enterica means gut. I guess I could have called it Brady rhizobium landeri. I probably would have gotten a phone call for naming a diarrhea bug after the big boss. Um, so this is really cool, and we were really excited at this point. Uh, but we had a problem, which was Brady rhizobium japonicum, which is the most closely related organism to Brady rhizobium enterica, is not a diarrhea-causing organism. Um, it's actually found in the roots of plants. And so if you were to pull you know, weeds out of your garden and look at the roots very closely, you might see little nodules. Those nodules are not plant um, in origin. They are actually caused by Brady rhizobia and similar organisms that have an endosymbiotic relationship with the plants, which means that the plants provide these organisms a place to live. And in exchange, these organisms fix nitrogen for the plant so that the nitrogen can use so the plant can use nitrogen in order to grow. So, you know, plant bacteria is very interesting, and I spent a lot of days reading about plant bacteria. But remember, I'm a hematologist and oncologist, and I'm studying diarrhea. And so I had to ask myself, well, what's different between these two organisms? They must be pretty different, because they seem to be living in very different areas. And so one way we can explore the differences between two organisms is to compare them genomically. And so on this graph, this is a circos plot, on the inner ring is these, are these green bars. Each green bar represents a contig, and they're just arrayed based on decreasing size. On the inner ring, which is what I'll call your attention to, everywhere where there is a dark blue line, there is a gene that is present in Brady rhizobium enterica that is absent in Brady rhizobium japonicum. And what you're meant to notice here is that there are a lot of blue lines which implies that there are a lot of differences between these two organisms. When we look a little bit more closely at the differences, we find a lot of genes that are critical for carbon fixation, and interestingly, a bunch of genes that encode filamentous hemagglutinins. Um, the filamentous hemagglutinins were particularly interesting to me because other pathogenic organisms or pathogenic bacteria, such as Bordadella pertussis, which causes human whooping cough, use these types of filamentous hemagglutinin genes to bind to the epithelia of the human airway. And so I thought maybe Brady rhizobium enterica is using these genes on their cell surface to bind to the intestinal epithelium. Remember, however, that I did all of this assembly, or we did all of this assembly, based on patient 11 alone. And so, what about patient five? I told you that we had sequenced both patient five and patient 11. Um, it was tempting to think that this organism may be causing this sort of disease, or at least was associated with this disease. Um, but we wanted to test a hypothesis that this organism was present in other cases of the disease. In order to do that, we took the B. enterica genome, and now we added it to the reference database. Okay, so now we have all of the known organisms that have been sequenced plus the draft genome for B. enterica, and we ran, we ran our computational taxonomic classification algorithm again, you know, classifying each and every sequence. When we did that, what we found was that the number of unmapped reads in patient five went from about 400,000 in this case down to 20,000, which is much more in line with what we would expect with the vast majority of reads mapping to Brady rhizobium enterica. Depicted pictorially, what you can see here is that B. enterica, or if this circle represents all total bacteria within the sample, B. enterica, which is in blue, is far outnumbering all other bacteria, which is pictured here in red. This is before antibiotics, this is after antibiotics. It's interesting to note that even after antibiotics, B. enterica is the main organism in town. Um, 
Not surprising, as clinically we found that these patients responded to antibiotics for a while, but as soon as, as, as antibiotics were stopped, they had a relapse of their disease, suggesting that the pathogen was still present. Um, I think the other thing that was really amazing to us when we found this was that, remember, people had worked really hard in the microbiology lab to try to identify the infection. And the infection, or the candidate infection, infectious agent, wasn't rare in these samples. It was like the main thing in the samples. We asked ourselves, well, where does Bradyrhizobium enterica exist? Is it in me and you and everybody? We all know that we have bacteria in our gut. Is it present at baseline and then in this unusual situation where patients are immunocompromised and being exposed to antibiotics, maybe that's when it grows out? And we decided to look using PCR. Um, PCR is a method to identify particular types or particular sequences of DNA. Here is a positive control, and you can see when the assay is positive for the organism, you get a little white line. In normal colon, we had no white lines, meaning no evidence of Bradyrhizobium enterica in normal colon, no Bradyrhizobium enterica in colon cancer, and I think most interestingly, no evidence of Bradyrhizobium enterica in patients who had undergone transplant who had another type of diarrheal syndrome, graft versus host disease. We did, however, identify Bradyrhizobium enterica in almost every other sample of the guts from patients with cord colitis syndrome. Okay, so remember when we had extracted DNA from that original cohort, there were some where we didn't have enough to do sequencing. Um, those are the ones that are pictured here in this validation cohort. I'm just gonna draw your attention down here to patient six. Um, patient six is a young woman who had leukemia. Um, during the course of her leukemia, she ended up having a viral colitis caused by CMV. At that time, she had a gut biopsy, and that was time point 6A. This was before she underwent a stem cell transplant. What you can see is at that time point, she did not have almost any Bradyrhizobium enterica. However, after the diagnosis of cord colitis syndrome, which is indicated by this blue arrow, she had lots of Bradyrhizobium enterica, suggesting that the organism was specifically present at the time of this clinical disease. We also were able to demonstrate that Bradyrhizobium enterica is found at the scene of the crime. So here I'm really trying to build a case that maybe this organism causes the disease. And in order to do this, and I apologize that it doesn't uh, project all that well here, this is a cross-section of a colon. This is that same colon cross-section where the human nuclei are stained blue and all bacteria will take up this green dye. And so this is fluorescence in situ hybridization. You can see that there are a lot of bacteria in these samples. If you take these same samples and you use a special probe that highlights the Bradyrhizobium enterica pink, you'll see that there's a lot of pink signal in these cross sections. If, however, you look at control cross sections, so these are patients' colons without cord colitis syndrome, there is some evidence of green signal, but no Bradyrhizobium enterica, suggesting that Bradyrhizobium enterica is specific to this syndrome and is localized to inflamed tissues. So at this point, and this is where the, the story or the chapter ends, although the book is not done yet, it's kind of like being at a crime scene without a body. You know, I see a chalk outline, you know, I have evidence, genomic evidence of the organism. You know, maybe we see some glasses, a piece of hair, a glove. Um, we have all of this evidence that suggests that something was there, a living organism was there, but no body. And that's where things are right now. We have a ton of genomic evidence suggest, to suggest that we've discovered a new organism, and then that organism was at the scene of the crime, we know a lot about the organism based on its DNA sequence. Um, you know, for example, something that you could get from this strand of hair. Um, but we don't actually have the organism in hand yet. I do think, however, what I've demonstrated to you is that the traditional pathogen discovery process, where we start with the disease, and then we isolate the potential pathogen, and eventually all roads lead to the broad and we sequence, can be at least partially reversed, and that we can start with the disease and without having any prior knowledge of what the candidate pathogen might be, 
we can use sequencing to identify a candidate pathogen. Of course, that needs to be followed up by trying to culture these organisms so that we can characterize them biologically. I mean, that work is underway. So in conclusion, this is the first demonstration to our knowledge of the assembly of a novel bacterial genome from a human tissue specimen. We discovered a new Brady rhizobium species which, with a potential disease association. And we discovered a candidate, candidate etiologic organism for cord colitis syndrome. I should tell you that the 30-year-old woman that I described earlier responded well to antibiotic therapy and is cured of her leukemia. Um, she does actually uh, have some long-term complications, unfortunately, of her stem cell transplantation, but is doing overall very, very well. Of course, any good story um, answers a few questions and asks many, many more, which has led to future directions that include trying to catch the perpetrator. Um, so we are actively trying to isolate and culture Brady rhizobium enterica. I'm also extremely interested in kind of exploring the dark matter or other new organisms that may be present in the human microbiome in health and disease using these types of approaches. I'm trying to identify the source of this infection. Um, since this is the first time this organism has been discovered, we actually have no idea where it normally lives, um, and we have no idea where it came from. And so with that, I will close with a large slide of acknowledgments. Um, this is work that can only be done in, honestly, a few places in the world, and it takes a ton of great scientists, good friends, and wonderful collaborators to make it through this sort of process. Um, first and foremost, I want to thank the Pathogen Discovery Group within Matthew Meyerson's lab. Uh, Matthew's a great boss in the cancer program. And alongside Sam Freeman, Chandra Petamalu, Fujiko Duke, and Veronica Manzo, um, this work has been undertaken over the last three years. Um, Janiel Jung is a former staff scientist here who really set the groundwork for a lot of the molecular biology approaches we use. And Akeen is another postdoc in the lab who also works in pathogen discovery. Um, of course, it takes money to do these sorts of experiments, and um, I'm very fortunate to be funded by groups who really believe in this sort of approach uh, because we really feel that this sort of approach has the potential to identify other causes of idiopathic diseases. The Bird Microbial Genomics crew has been a great source of collaboration and new ideas. And this is an example of a project that um, leads to the intersection and collaboration of a bunch of different departments um, within the Broad. We work with a bunch of area hospitals, folks at Mass General Hospital, Brigham and Women's Hospital, and the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. And finally, I'd like to thank the Meyerson Lab um, and other folks within our community who've been incredibly helpful in pushing this forward and, and giving me great ideas over the course of my time here. Um, Leslie Gaffney helped with the graphic arts, and absolutely uh, all the thanks for the type of human research that goes on belongs to our patients. Um, as someone who sees patients, I am awed by the fact that people are so generous in giving us their time, in giving us their samples, and giving us their permission to do this sort of science. Um, I have been the recipient of a lot of great ideas, a lot of great samples, um, and even stool of patients. Um, <laughs> you know, when you're in my line of work, getting stool sent to you from North Carolina, um, there's nothing better than that. <laughs> Um, so with that, I thank you very much for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Uh, wonderful talk. Uh, what is the incidence of the cord colitis syndrome in patients that receive the uh, umbilical cord? Yeah, so it's very like, rare. It was first described in 2011, so we don't really have a lot of international data yet. There are those 11 cases at Brigham and Women's Hospital. That was over a denominator of about 120 patients. So the incidence in this hospital of patients who had undergone umbilical cord blood transplant was about 10%. I can tell you that other institutions have looked to see if this disease is occurring in their, uh, in their practice as well. Some believe it is, some believe it isn't. And I think the jury's still out. We don't know the incidence of the disease. Um, but my sense is that it's a rare complication of a very rare treatment. 
Yeah, so the question was, did all of the patients have the cord blood transplants here? And the answer is yes. Hi, your talk was wonderful. It was very interesting. Can you say a few sentences about how you're going to uh, address the culturing fact of it? Yeah. Are you going to go and take a look at, like, you know, going through plant cell culture or organ cell culture? Great question. So there are a lot of questions kind of buried in that question, but the fundamental question is how, are, how am I going to go about trying to culture something when I have no idea where it's from and I don't know how to culture it? Um, I'll answer the second question that I posed for myself first. How to culture it? There are data on how to culture Bradyrhizobium japonicum, and those are the methods that I've been using to try to culture the organism. I've been successful in culturing related organisms. In terms of where to look, um, we're trying to obtain stool samples from patients with this disease. We're looking at environmental sources of this organism. And we've also actually looked from a sequence-based perspective at soil metagenomes, for example, from the Massachusetts area. Knowing that related organisms come from the stool, we've been looking to see if there's any sequence evidence of where this organism might live. Um, right now, there's some evidence to suggest that maybe it lives in you know, water purifying systems, but we certainly don't know for sure. I drink out of the tap and not out of the Brita water filter, if people are curious. Uh, hey, very nice talk, actually. Uh, my question is, if is, was there any difference in, or is there any commonality between the patients who develop this uh, cord colitis and versus the patients which didn't develop? And also, if this disease exists in, you know, known uh, transplant, you know, in general, if this disease exists in other, you know, type of patients. Good question. Patients, so. so we don't have any, this is a fairly new disease, so I think we don't know if it exists in other clinical situations and other types of, for example, organ transplant. In terms of clinical differences between the patients who got the disease, you know, the 10% who got the disease and the 90% who did not, um, unfortunately, 10%, you know, 11 patients isn't quite enough to draw statistical power to determine if there were true differences. We looked, um, but we have not found any clinical factor or disease-related factor that was statistically significantly enriched in patients with the disease versus those without. Um, but if we're able to identify more patients with the disease, I think we'll be able to further pursue this. And we do have some hypotheses as to what treatments they might have been exposed to that may have at least made it more likely that they got this disease. Um, but at this point, it's all very speculative. Um, but we do think maybe antibiotic exposure um, was what led to killing off of a lot of other bacteria, which may have led to the opportunity for these relatively slow-growing bacteria of the Brady rhizobium genus to, to grow up. Yeah, I'm sorry. I have things on my lab. Um, you pointed out the, uh, I'm here, the uh, differences between Japonicum and Enterica. I'm curious as to whether you've uh, thought or speculated about the similarities given that Japonicum is a, an endosymbiont mm -hmm. and actually in plants the, the sort of the, the good bacteria that provide this benefit of nitrogen fixation actually in some cases bear only a few differences to bad bacteria that cause disease in plants. Mm -hmm. Uh, and there's subtle differences between those uh, species and strains. Um, is there any thought as to how this bacterium might have arisen in, in, as a human? Clearly, it's a pathogen, not a, not a symbiont, but uh, what, 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 is there any relationship there? Are there any molecules that could be similar in plants and humans that would attract this type of bacteria? Absolutely. I think those are all excellent points and, uh, and excellent questions. There are many similarities, including the types of secretion mechanisms that would potentially allow Bradyrhizobium enterica to invade intestinal cells. It is, in fact, my hypothesis that Bradyrhizobium enterica uses a similar machinery to enter human cells as Bradyrhizobium japonicum uses to get into plant cells. In terms of your question regarding pathogenicity, I think there are a lot of virulence factors that we can predict based on sequence that exist in enterica that may confer pathogenicity. Um, but you know, those are the sorts of hypotheses that certainly need further testing. Um, it's part of the reason we're so eager to try to culture this organism is then we can really pursue some, some genetics and mechanistic characterization. Yes. Well, I, I guess my question follows on from his. If you've got an organism with japonicum that's similar enough to induce an immune response that would also cross-react with that, can you use the japonicum to, say, feed cows to get milk or something like that 
that would give you some sort of anti an antibodies that would work better than the antibiotics are currently working? Absolutely. So it, the idea is to, to generate, you know, one, to use related organisms in biological mechanistic experiments to try to investigate hypotheses. That's something we're absolutely interested in and plan to pursue. The second part of the question is, can we raise antibodies to a similar organism and then use those as tools to investigate enterica? And that certainly can be done. Um, it is something we're interested in pursuing. I will say, coming back to the previous question, I didn't mention that some of the innate immunity um, that is present in humans is actually also present in plants. And so one of the interesting side uh, projects that has come out of this is trying to look at similarities between plant immunity and human immunity in this heavily immunocompromised patient population. Okay, we have time for about two more questions. Thank you. Um, well, when we think of a bacterium, we think of a cell uh, with all the components and the uh, DNA encapsulated. And what you're finding is naked DNA. Mm -hmm. Is it possible that naked DNA having risen through some process we don't understand, is able to do damage by itself? That's a good question. I think it's within the realm of possibility. Uh, hard to really know the answer to that question because we don't know if the DNA that we're extracting from these samples was naked or if it was encapsulated. I will say we, we have uh, erred on the side of believing that it is likely encapsulated, it's present um, in an entire organism, but it's possible that it's naked. I think we don't know that. Uh, but it's an interesting idea. Uh, you mentioned that um, this pathogen has a bunch of virulence factors that don't have much homology to japonicum. Did you find homology of, between those and virulence factors in known pathogens? Could they have arisen by horizontal gene transfer? Yes. Um, so we do find uh, homology between certain virulence, so predicted virulence factors in B. enterica and related organisms. I do think that this organism evolves by horizontal gene transfer, and we found evidence of actually some pretty uh, full transposition operon, so this clearly encodes a transposase and an integrase, so I think genes are popping around between different organisms, and that's how this organism likely came to be, um, but you know, still a lot of work to do, but absolutely. Okay. Hi. Um, you mentioned the SEN virus had one uh, contig, mm -hmm. and you also mentioned that virus contig or virus DNA is significantly shorter. Mm -hmm. So, is it possible in any way that the SEN virus is still the pathogen? It is within the realm of possibility. Most SEN viruses are not pathogenic. Um, they are thought to be organisms that live. Um, quite commonly in immunocompromised individuals, although I cannot prove that it is not the pathogen. We don't have quite the full uh, genome of the SEN virus, and so we ended up with about 3,000 base pairs, which constituted that SEN virus. SEN viruses typically have a fully circular DNA chromosome, and we don't have quite a full circle. So we think we do have the genome of a novel, or a partial genome of a novel SEN virus. It's not completed, and then based on homology to other organisms, we think that it's less likely to be the pathogen, although it's within the realm of possibility. We did look for the SEN virus in patient five. Patient five did not have the SEN virus. And so that also supports the hypothesis that it wasn't actually the pathogen, but was a bystander. Well, thank you again, Ami. And I'd like to invite everyone to join us.